Morning, everyone. Nice to see you again. Nice to be back with you and to learn with you. We're picking up here from Mechaskal Perikat Zion, Pasuk Laman Vav. A brief recap, I would say that we spent already two different classes on this Perak. I would divide them into two. The first part of this Perak, if you remember, was a very graphic description of the upbringing of the Knesset Yisrael, the Jewish people, as if Hashem had been someone who found this little baby girl who had been abandoned by her parents and even the basic necessities um, necessary to take care of an infant weren't done for this, this baby girl. And this father took her in and made her beautiful and brought her to maturity and adorned her with all sorts of jewelry, etc. So that description of the kindness of the father or husband is the first part of chapter 16. And the next part of it is the bad part where Hashem says, that was what I did to you. And obviously it's all a parable and that little girl is the Jewish people and the kindness is taking them out of Mitzrayim and taking them to the desert and giving them the Torah, performing miracles for them and bring them into Eretz Israel and bring, building the base of Mikdash and giving them autonomy and grandeur and prominence among the nations. And then throughout the first temple period, and now we're at the end of the first temple period, the Jewish people, instead of appreciating what Hashem had done for them, begin to forsake him. And specifically, we'll turn to these two sins, specifically worship idolatry. And we talked in the second part of this chapter about how that seems to gradually get worse and worse. And it begins with sort of praying to Hashem and to idols, or, and then, you know, the nation, the idols of the nations immediately around them, and then additional idols and additional foreign forms of worship. And also it, it included the very horrific, disgraceful practice of slaughtering their children and offering those as sacrifices to those foreign deities, which is a mixture of murder and idolatry, not a good recipe for success. <laughs> Um, and so that was the second part of the chapter. And if you remember very graphically, the, the Navi compares that sort of sinful behavior to a, the young woman, the young, beautiful princess becoming an adulteress, becoming a prostitute, engaging in prostitution and licentious behavior and essentially, um, living with all sorts of different suitors. That is how Hashem compares. Um, that is what Hashem compares the the sin of serving other gods and and engaging in the religious practices of other idolatrous nations to. So that's a very brief synopsis of what we've done until now, and the end of this chapter very on, on uh, in a very frightful way describes the punishment that Hashem promises to pay onto the Jewish people for their sins and for this sin in specific. So we're, we're going to read from Pasuk Laman Vav. I'm going to read a few psukim at a time, then pause, I believe, where I think it's appropriate. And uh, hopefully, please feel free to jump in. If you something jumps up in your mind, if something inspires you, so here we go, or here we go. Ko Amar Hashem Elohim, so says the Lord God. So most Mepharshim see this as a double phraseology of something not so great, it meaning the same thing. Since you have poured out your nakedness and revealed your nakedness, if you're interested, a barbanel sees the word nechushtech as bottom, the bottom of a person. So you have revealed your bottom. I don't need to get more graphic than that. And you have revealed your nakedness. With your prostitution upon your lovers, and all your abominable deities, figures, who can and like the blood of your children, that you have given them. That blood of the children refers to the child sacrifice. Therefore, I am going to gather all your, all your lovers whom you have 
taken as guarantors, who you have relied upon. Arev is a language, there's been two ways of interpreting it, and Arev is a guarantor, somebody who can take care of you in a time of need. And an Arev also means um, desirable, someone that you take pleasure in. So these are the nations that you have confided in, take taken pleasure in. Mepharshim see these as the allies that Jerusalem or the Jewish people tried to make with some of the surrounding nations. Mitzrayim is, is a prominent one. Um, specifically, Mitzrayim, I, that if you read the, the Pesukim at the end of Yermiyahu, Hashem specifically tells the Jews not to run away to Mitzrayim. They do it anyway. So Mitzrayim, Ashur is another one. Ashur, the nation of Assyria, whom the Jews tried to make an alliance with, and then they ended up coming in and conquering and sieging and breaking into Israel and exiling the ten nations. So that's the Mahavayach, the your, your lovers, the Kolasher and all those you've loved, all Kolasher Sanit, upon all the other nations you have despised, like the Plishtim. And then did you like any other nation, the Jewish people? had allies or attempted allies who they relied upon and nations they never made any sort of alliance with. And Hashem is saying, I'm going to grab them all together. And they are going to gather you, gather upon you, surrounding you. I shall reveal your nakedness to them. They shall see all your nakedness. I shall judge you like give you the punishment of adulterous women, and of murderers. And I shall put upon you the blood of anger and jealousy. I will put you in their hands. They will desecrate and shatter your high places. And your pride. They will strip you of your clothing. They will take the your beautiful utensils, your beautiful garments. They will leave you naked, totally naked. They shall gather a congregation upon you and stone you. And they shall stab you with their swords. They will burn your daughters in fire. And they will do horrific punishments to you in front of many women. They will rid you. From prostitutes, the gametz nano you will no longer give any pay for prostitution. Hanichoti chamati bach, the sarah kinatimi mech. I will unleash my anger upon you, and my jealousy will be removed from you. Vishakati, and then I will be silent below echas o, and I will no longer be angry. We'll read one more pasuk, which is really a transition pasuk. We'll, we'll go one more further for now. Since you didn't remember the days of your youth, and you angered me with all this. So too I have put your ways in front of me. No mashem lo kim. So says the word, the Lord God. This next ver sentence is very difficult to translate. There's two ways to read it. So the, the way that most read it is, Did you not do all of this zima is licentiousness upon all your abom abominations? Meaning, don't you have this coming? Don't you realize everything you've done wrong? Don't you realize all of your infidelity? Radak, um translates a little bit differently. He sees the word zima from the word zamam, which is to plot something. 
And what he says is that lo asita hazima kol tovatayich. Zima actually here refers to what was intended for you to do, which is teshuva. That I sent all these prophets to you to do teshuva, and you never did teshuva from all your abominations. The bottom line is, again, remembering you forsook me. You didn't remember the kindness I performed to you when you were young, a young nation, and therefore I act in the same way towards you. Okay. That's all pretty brutal, <laughs> pretty brutal, not easy. A very frightful number of psukim. Again, very graphic, very specific description of punishment. So let's uh, regroup a little bit and reflect upon these psukim. What stands out to you about psukim Alam and Vav 36 through Mem Gimel 43? And specifically, Specifically, let's let's ask a few questions that I think we need to identify. Um, what do you think about the punishments mentioned in this in this group of psukim? Say, starting with Lama Chet, Lama Tet. Um, there's a specific description of the ways Hashem is going to punish them. It starts with the revealing of nakedness. Not 100% clear what that refers to. Um, stripping of clothing, they're going to see you naked. And then, and then there is a gathering of a great congregation, stoning, stabbing with swords, burning of children. When you hear about those punishments, aside from hopefully you won't get too many nightmares, <laughs> not exactly, uh, not exactly the funnest thing to think about. But when you hear about those horrific punishments, what do you think the Navi is trying to communicate here? Meaning, obviously, it's meant to be not to be taken literally, or not exactly literally. It's describing the destruction, the impending destruction of Yerushalayim, and we know that when Melech Bavel Nebuchadnezzar finally destroyed the temple and went in to destroy Jerusalem. A lot of people died and were taken into captivity and there was a lot of literal suffering, right? So that, in some sense, is what it's referring to, but it's obviously described in a specific way. So what stands out to you about that? Yes, Sherry. So it seems like a very public kind of punishment, and it seems intended not only to create within B'nai Israel a sense of its own shame, but that this is a shame that is going to be broadcast to the other nations, that the other nations are going to be involved. In right, 100%. It's, uh, that's the revealing of nakedness. It's a humiliation, right? 100%. Yes, Brandel. Well, while this is all true, and it's very upsetting, obviously we get punished for our sins, it does and leads to the Babylonian exile. But... Jews do amazing things, and there's amazing thought that comes out of the Babylonian exile. So I guess if you could think far, far enough ahead, then the bad does eventually lead to some good things happening. But it's hard to look that far ahead and yeah. ignore all the shame and all the punishments we're getting now. 100%. I think that's a, I think that's a great comment for someone who's in the middle of reading a customer saying, oh my gosh, this is awful. <laughs> I'm just going to put this back on my shelf. <laughs> right. <laughs> don't worry. There is, a, there is um, a positive element to exile as well. So I hear that point, certainly, and there's a lot to say about that. I'm not sure that's the focus of this chapter specifically. Right now, it seems like we're focused on the bad part. <laughs> Right, but the but yeah. the thing that that strikes me is that in Jewish history, um, somehow there's always hope. Now you're right. At this point, it's the bad stuff. But By the way, in Jewish history, there is always hope somewhere along the line, which has kept us alive. And I think in Yechazel specifically, and even then in this chapter, it, it it's most of these doomsday prophecies. Let's label them that way. Usually end with some sort of positive note. It usually ends with. And after now that and after I really, really give it to you, you know, hopefully then you'll understand where you went wrong. And you know, sometimes even ends with and I'll ultimately I'll bring you back. So 100 percent I think that's necessary. Yes, Esther seems very uh, and we'll go to Vanessa. Go for it. Um, but we do we do sin, seem to sin a lot. 
and we never seem to learn from our sins to to, yes. to listen to what the Navi says and change our behavior so that we don't have these horrible things. We seem very good at ignoring. And I think most Navi, uh, they all seem to get ignored. And you wonder how they manage to keep their spirits going and their prophecies going when the Jewish people never seem to listen. All fair points, 100%. Yes, Esther. Um, it feels like a reversal of all of their activity. It's a midah k'neg and midah. You know, they've been dressed up in all this, uh, like a harlot. Now it's going to be stripped of them. They'll be naked. They burn children. They will be burnt. And even the imagery, you keep hearing ya'an, and I keep thinking affliction, and uh, the language of was like air of rav, you know, like you behave like the air of rav. And you get this imagery from the language uh, of showing them a mirror, holding up a mirror to their behavior, and it's going to be turned on them. Uh, it's going to be done to them the way they've been behaving. Right. I think your point about Mila Kanegi Mila is 100% on target. I think that's what plus this verse 43 refers to. Because you didn't remember what I did for you in your youth, and it's a big theme in this, this chapter, then I will do the same to you. And I think specifically to Sherry's point earlier, when she talks about that public humiliation, that is a sort of also midah k'nege midah, measure for measure punishment, because mm -hmm. if what B'nai Israel did was try to like sort of expose themselves to these other nations, to try to make alliances with them, to take in their cultures, worship their gods, you know, they tried to expose themselves in this way. So then Hashem is saying, well, you want, you're going to, you want to expose yourself to other nations. You, are you trying to, you think my religion or my Torah and mitzvot and worshiping me isn't enough. You need to worship the gods of other nations. Okay. So we'll watch how the other nations will be involved in the punishment for forsaking me and my religion. They'll be involved in that too. You're revealing yourself to the other nations. You're exposing yourself. So I'll expose your nakedness as well. A hundred percent. So that's a hundred percent on. Yes, Vanessa. I think the the last line is the killer that he that God will ignore us. He will turn his face away from us. I cannot imagine a life without God. I mean, you always yeah. turn to God when in times of sorrow and in good times you rely on Him. That's the worst curse, I think. Right. Well, yeah, well, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Like, I don't know in, in the last line it says he's going to turn his face. It actually sounds like he's what's it what's interesting about it is that he's he's saying, Darkech Barosh Nasati, I have put your way, literally translated in my head. It sort of sounds like he's not turning away, but taking it head on, meaning like mine, pardon me, but mine uh says um that I will. I will turn away. Oh, that's what, that's another translation of the Kirkeperosh Nasati. Okay, that's fair. That's, that's maybe one translation. I'm not sure it's the only way translation. I see that more as I'm going to look you straight in the face and give you what you deserve. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, um, 100%. And, and Rabbi, I know that Hanukkah isn't that far away, but the whole of the theme of Hanukkah uh, where was Hellenism taking over and us g giving up what we had. And now, and now with, with Hanukkah, we go back to, we have a revolution and we go a rebellion and we get back. And I'm wondering whether or not that's kind of a foreshadowing of, of the future. I don't know. Yeah, well, it's a very common theme. I think, yeah. I mean, I, I think this is a bit different, but 100%, I mean, you know, the, the problem with assimilation and assimilating other cultures is a, is a common one. I do want to put, just before we move on from these to Kim, I want to sort of return to the specific punishments here. So if you, you'll notice, again, it's stoning, it's burning your children, your daughters. These actually reflect punishments that were a part of capital punishment carried out by, at least by Torah law, by Jewish courts, right? So, mm -hmm. and some of them are for adultery and murder, yeah. right? Um, you know, we, we don't like to think about these too much, but certain forms of adultery involve burning, certain forms of adultery involve Stone. hanging, killing, murdering involves death by the sword, Right. So um, I believe. 
So I believe, and that's that specific, that Hashem is literally saying, I'm going to give you the same punishments as, you know, you know, adulterous and prostitutes, prostitutes, adulterous women, and for prostitution and for murder. I'm going to give yes. you those same punishments and your punishers will be the nations whom you try to make an alliance with and whose gods you worship. So that's a very striking image. Um, and then the Sarfu Batayach Ba'ish, um, it might be translated literally, but a lot of this also might be referring to the land. Uh, that Knesset Yisrael is not any specific person, it's the nation of Israel, and their beauty and the, the clothes are getting stripped, likely refer to, you know, the physical elements of Israel, the, the, the walls being breached. You know, the beautiful buildings being ransacked, the temple being destroyed, the utensils being taken away. And at, to the nation of Israel, that's that's almost like a total stripping of their beauty and exposing of, of Yerushalayim. Um, and so why the Navi is sort of taking that to the next level and looking at the Jewish people as if they were one person and saying, just as one person would get these sorts of punishments had they committed these sins, the other nations of the world are who you try to take in their idolatrous cultures. They're going to give you those same punishments, right? Let, let's Rabbi, I, think, excuse me, I think that's why there's such an emphasis on nakedness, the stripping away, and that's yeah. why the use of the word naked so much. Yeah, well, it's certainly very striking. A little bit more than I would have liked. Right. I'm Moya Cheskel, and maybe I shouldn't be saying things like that. <laughs> so to Pasuk Memzal, let's move a little bit. He may call him, verse 44. He may call him with Shalayach Yim Sholimor. This is also going to be a challenging one. Anybody who makes a parable about you, a poem about you, will make the following parable. They're going to say, Ki'ima like a mother, so to her daughter. What does that mean? It, it, it's not like a positive version of the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, I assure you. <laughs> you are your mother's daughter. Goelet Isha Uvana, one who despises her husband and children. You are your sister's sister. Asher Galu on Shehenu who have despised their people, their, their, their husbands and their children. Your mother, and this we mentioned at the beginning of the chapter as well, your mother is a Chitite. Your father is an Amorite. Your, your, your bigger sister is Shomron. Her and her daughter. Shomron was the northern part of the kingdom of Israel. Shomron refers to the ten tribes. Right. So just historically, and in terms of this, the, the stage that the, that the Navi is referring to, this is after, well into the first temple period, the Jewish kingdom, or at the beginning of the first temple period, uh, after Shlomo HaMeles, Melucha, the Jewish kingdom split into two. And there was the kingdom of Yehuda and Benjamin, which is focused in Yerushalayim. And there is the kingdom of the other 10 tribes started by Yeravam ben Avad, who was uh, from Sheva Ephraim, that was, was in the Shomron in the north. And those 10 tribes had already been exiled, had already been punished. And there was no more kingdom of the 10 tribes at this point in history. So Hashem is saying, you, your bigger sister is Shomron, which sits to your, your left, make your little sister, sitting on your right, Stom Ubenotea, is Sidom and her daughters. Or Notea can also mean towns. Have you not gone in their same paths? Or a CT. It's written, it's read a seat, and you have acted in their abominable ways. Have you not almost in the same that they have done? I will destroy you as someone who acted in all their ways. By my life, says the Lord God, If you, if, if, meaning 
to say it hasn't. Stom, your sister, did not do as you and your daughters have done. This was the sin of your sister Sidon. Go'on sivat lechem shalva hashkeit, who enjoyed satiation from bed, bread, and peace and prosperity. to it and to its daughters. And yet, it did not. She did not support the hands. Of the poor and the destitute. They became haughty and they acted abominably in front of me. And I imprisoned them and tied them up like you see. Shomron did not even do like half of your sins. Your abominable acts were even more than theirs. You have made your you have made your sister righteous with all the abominable things you have done. You also bear humiliation. That you have judged your sister with. With the sins. The disgusting things you have done, which um, she became more righteous than you. Bear your humiliation, be, be humiliated in the way that you have made your sister righteous. And I will return the captivity of Sidon and her daughters and the captivity of Shomron and her daughters. And your captivity will turn among them. So that you shall bear the humiliation of all that you have done. And they comfort you. Your sister Sidon will return to what she was originally, Vishomron of Noteha, Tashon Lakanamatan, Shomron, and again the word Benotel here can either mean daughters or towns, um, shall return to how they were originally. Was not Sidom your sister a shmua, something that you talked about with your mouth? At the day of your grandeur, when you were high, when you were great. Before your evil was revealed, like the time of the humiliation of the daughters of Aram and the who, and, and all the daughters of the, uh, the Plishim who surround you, meaning I, I, this is what I am about to do in revealing your evil is, is in the same way that I did reveal it to Aram and, and the nation of the Plishim who have persecuted in the past. You, you will bear your um, licentiousness and your abominations no Hashem. So such is the word of God. Okay. okay. I know that was a lot, and it's it's hard to parse through all of it, but I do want to focus on the main themes. So looking carefully, we just read from Pasuk Mem Gimel or Mem Dalid, that's 43, through um, Pasuk Nun Chet, 58. If you look through those verses carefully, what is the theme of these? What, what do what are Bnei Israel constantly compared to or connected to? Sodom. Sodom, correct. Sodom. In what ways? And Shomron. And Shomron, right? In what ways? How does the Navi connect Ta Israel to Sodom? What does it call Sodom? 
this is what I didn't understand. Why is, how is Saddam a sister? Like the, the right? Samran Shum, makes more sense, right? That's the tribe. Right, right. right. They're, they're non-Jews. I mean, it's compared like, well, you were even worse than that. So it's kind right. of a hyperbolic, a hyperbolic. Yeah, it sounds hyperbolic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Fair. But I don't understand why the two are, like how could they both be sisters? Right, so Sherry, I think, identifies the real difficulty with these psukim, which is the familial relationships described in the Navi. It's not just Sedom, by the way. It's an, We already saw this, and it's repeated here. Your mother is a chiti. Your father okay. is an amori. Right. That's not a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> not good heritage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Although I guess like they're, you know, I guess if you're really angry at someone and you're afraid of what you might say, you might just say, your father is an emory. You know? <laughs> I think that might uh, go over better than some other choice words people say. <laughs> anyway. No, but if you're angry, you might say, how often do people say you're just like you're, you know, the parent that they don't ah, like. That, ah, that's a great You point. know, you're a bum like your father or like your mother yeah, or whatever. Yeah, and I yeah, think yeah, that's... Okay. Fair, fair. That's true. That's true. Fair. Um, so that we have this very deliberate comparison to Sodom and Shomron, and also connection in a way described as a blood relationship. Now, obviously, that's not literal, right? As as Sherry points out, Shomron that that we understand, and there are a few times where Shomron and the kingdoms of Judah and Sharon are, are seen as sisters. But Sodom, I mean, let's think about it historically, right? Like Sodom was destroyed thousands of years before. So yeah. it's obviously not literal, obviously. But the question is, it means on a very basic level that your behavior is so awful that it's similar to them. And look what happened to them. Right? Yeah. That's on a very basic level, but I want to dig in a little deeper. Esther has an observation. Go for it. Uh, just the thought that if there are error of rub or if there's been a lot of intermarriage, uh, then there would be that blood relationship. And they've carried okay. down and they've carried down that part of their genealogy. That's possible. That's not a bad point. Maybe a Maureen Chiti and and Kla Israel are criticized for intermarriage. Um, my my memory that comes to mind is actually much later in Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah accuse them of intermarriage. I believe in Malachi, which is also later, there's uh, an accusation of cohabiting with Gentile women. Yeah. Um, so that's a, that's a possibility. Sidon seems more unlikely, though. If they were all killed thousands <laughs> of years earlier, it seems unlikely they intermarried with Sidon. <laughs> So again, my question then, I think we need to think about is, so God could say, you guys are so bad, you're like Sodom. In fact, he does, by the way. I'll make an interesting point. In, 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 there, I'm, I'm, I'm actually forget. I think it's in Yeshayahu, Chazon Yeshayahu ben Amok, in the first chapter of Yeshayahu, which we read for the Haftorah on the Shabbat before Tisha B'Av. It says that your, your sin is like Chatat Sodom. Your sin is like the sin of Sodom. And generally, by the way, if you want to think of like the worst people, Sodom is like the, the, what the Navi chooses. So that's not uncommon. What is uncommon is to say that you're Sodom's sister. Mm. That's a very particular way of saying the Jewish people are so bad that they're just like Sodom. To say that they're their sister, and, it's, and it goes on with this, right? It, it really drives this home. And it's in, in, in one way that's very strange. The Navi here mentions that I'm going to return Sodom and Shomron from their captivity, and I'm going to return you from your captivity among them. So the one that's like some good news, like hey, that's <laughs> <her> <laughs> captivity. That's good. But the, the emphasis that you're just like them, you're going to be among them. That even when you return from this exile, you're going to be right next to Sodom and Shimon. They're also going to be returned. So what point is that driving? That's as in our observation. No, uh, no, I just no. I have a question actually. Um, in Eshvut Sodom, how does it translate? I don't have an English translation. How does it translate Shvut? Shvut is captivity. 
Okay, because yeah, I was just wondering why it's it's got it uses the U like Chevy. Like yeah, a, that's a great point, a great uh, observation. That's a bit of a challenge. Um, there are many words in these chapters that seem to have extra yuds. Oh. Um, there is probably, if you look in sort of academic biblical literature, there's probably a lot written about that. A Barbanel simply says that. I guess a bit of a, a bit of a troubling statement, but he says that in Yechaskel, and I think he mentions another sefer, I forget which one, they weren't so particular about spelling. Now, if you look, that's what he says, they added some yuds. Now, if you look at the uh, at your Navi, it probably has a parenthesis, shvut kri, shvut kri, shvut kri. So, um, the, well, it does it, it with the asit as well. Like a, sorry, yeah. No, with the asit as well, the asit and asiti. Yes, yes, um, yes. How, how is that? How is that handled? The uh, it's creative. So the way we read it is without the yud. How you explain why the yuds are there? It seems on a very basic level, and I hadn't really looked into this, but it, it <laughs> seems that the uh, the author of Yechazkel, um, and you know, it's not necessarily <laughs> that Yechazkel himself wrote this. I don't remember who the Talmud ascribes the authorship of Yechazkel to, but it seems that they had a certain way of spelling certain words, and that we don't have. Um, I, but I don't have too much more to say about it. Uh, Barbanel simply says this is the way they spelled it in this chapter, and there's a lot of extra yuds, and we would spell them with vavs. So there's definitely a lot more there you could look into if you're interested. Um, but the word is shavut, as, as understood, it means captivity. And it's a very challenging thing. I was looking at the Barbanel, he says it, it seems to be saying that at the end of times when Mashiach comes, that the locale of Sodom will be repopulated. It's kind of a strange thing to sort of emphasize. I mean, I'm all for Shomron coming back and the 10 tribes coming back, but Sodom? Yeah. Uh, what, what does that even mean? But I think the point really is when you think about blood relationships, right? So that's sort of impugning B'nai Israel in a certain way. Your mother is a this, your father is a that. The focus on blood, on sort of lineage. The way I would interpret it is, is that it's responding to a certain superiority the Jews must have felt. Hmm. And this is part of the point, because there is a point here in the Navi where the Navi says, you know, Stom used to be a Shmu'ah Bethif in uh, Pasuk Nanvav. Your sister Sodom used to be a Shmu'ah, meaning that means you used to talk about Sodom. That used to be something maybe you would tell your children. Oh, you know, don't, you know, there was a really, really awful nation that had all these awful things. And and that there, it was called Sodom. You know what happened? Hashem overturned that, that city. By the way, which is a totally legitimate thing to discuss. But here's the thing. Here's where it comes a problem. Meaning, I think what the Navi is saying here is that there was a certain tendency. And okay, go ahead. There's more the, Jewish people, Thanks. the Jewish people would look around at other nations and, and at previous history and say, oh my gosh, those people... They were awful, right? Like they were so bad. Oh, the kingdom of Shomron in the north? They were exiled by Tanchir of Melech Asher. You know why? Because they, they were awful. Ah, ah, were they sinful. Ah, were they bad. And that's just what looking. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you know the story of Sodom? Oh my gosh, were they so bad. They were awful. And they were awful. And the Navi here is saying a specific sort of, I would say, dissonance. That, that Sodom was prosperous, they were wealthy, they had peace and prosperity. And what they do? Number one, and this is what they're famous for, and you know, Chazal really used this Pasuk in Yechezkel to interpret why, you know, the story with Avraham Avinu, when Avraham goes to Sodom, or excuse me, and then Lo goes to Sodom and the whole thing's overturned, the, this is an insight into what they really did wrong is that they were so malicious to the people among them and they didn't support the destitute and the needy. Even though they had all this wealth, they ignored those who were in need. And the Chazal take that to the next level. But the truth is, simply being totally not receptive to the needs of those in your midst when you have the ability to help them is seen as a very horrific offense here. On top of that, when they had all this prosperity, when they were high, 
they committed all sorts of atrocities. And in the Torah, that refers to specifically sexual immorality. That the Torah says, don't do like Sodom, you know, and, and that refers to certain licentious relationships. So indeed, Sodom was really, really bad. In fact, there's a, there's a, there's a notion in the Gemara, I'll just mention in passing, not really our topic now, but the Gemara talks about, or the mission of Os, I should say, talks about Midat Sodom. Midat Sodom, the attribute of Sodom is, when you can help someone at no expense and no cost to yourself, and yet you say, you refuse to do so. You say, no, what's mine is mine, what's yours is yours, is midat sedom. I don't have to help you if I don't want to, mm. right? I don't have to, I don't have to, even if it's at no cost to me, it's no expense. I guess the classic, and this, there's discussions in halacha about this, when this is allowed or appropriate, I guess the classic discussion would be, let's say you have a big uh, driveway with all sorts of space and you're, go you're uh, going away for a few weeks and your neighbor asks you, can I park in your driveway? And you say, no. no. Why not? I don't want you to park in my driveway. My driveway. I decide to park in my driveway. No one else does. So again, assuming that you have absolutely nothing to lose by helping your neighbor out in that circumstance, that sort of arrogance and um, possessiveness is described as midat sodom. And the source for that primarily from Tanakh would probably be from our chapter here in Yechezkel. But mm -hmm. the point that Navi's actually making here is saying, I think like this, there's a certain tendency to sort of our excuse our own behavior by saying, what about, you see those people? And they're worse. They're so bad. <laughs> they're so bad. And I, I, I think this is actually very common where, you know, people really like to talk about how the other people are not from. The other people, you know, they're, they're barely observing. Look how horrible they are. Look how disgusting they are. Meanwhile, the person themselves ain't the biggest sodic in the world, right? You know, like they're they're nothing to brag about. And so, and 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 a further point I think is that what what gives the Jewish people or Yehuda, the kingdom of Yehuda in Jerusalem, the arrogance to say that you know who we are, you know who we are, <laughs> we are Melech, you know. We have descendants from Dovna Melech. We're the descendants of Aram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. We are the chosen people. We are the base of Mikdash. And almost a certain thought process of based just on my DNA and my biology, that means that I'm amazing. And whatever I do is not such a big deal. And I can look down at all these other people. And so and I would say in a very bothersome way. They're not be saying your mother is a chiti and your you're an, and your father is an amori, meaning like, and that even if that's not literally true, but it might as well be. You're acting just as bad as them and you're worse than them. The Navi's words here. You're just you're worse than Sodom. You're worse than Shomron. And whatever happened to them is about to happen to you. And even when you come back from that, it's going to be among them. They're going to come back to you. You're no different than them. Don't look in the mirror and say, ah, I, we're, 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 we're in Yerushalayim. We have, you know, you know, Kahuna and Livia. We have special blood. We are awesome. Your blood relatives are Sodom and Shomron <laughs> and Amori and, and Chiti. You don't, do not look at your, you look at simply your lineage and say, that makes me special. That makes me better. I think that that's, the, the critique here. That's the, the, the reason for the choice of they're your sister, they're your daughter. All, all this mention of family relationships is to say, do not let this superiority complex distract you from how absolutely despicable your behavior has been. I think the word toeva, which is used again and again, um, it can be understood through this mention of Sodom also. Sodom had it all. They had all this good stuff. They had prosperity, they had serenity, and then they didn't, they, they totally didn't appreciate it, and they didn't use it to help those in need among them, and they performed all these atrocities, and, and Hashem punished them for that. 
Toeva, I think in this context, can be described as not just doing bad, but this total dissonance between opportunity that is given to a person or to a nation and the way they use that. You could be so amazing. God gave you so many gifts, and yet you respond in this despicable way. That's toeva. That's abominable. So I do think that that's a lot of what's going on here. Okay, let's try to let's try to finish the last few psukim here of Parak Zion so we can go on. I know you're all waiting for a little bit of a happy note to end with. So here we go. It's gonna start not so great, but it ends nicely. How Amar Hashem Elokim, so says the Lord God. The asiti ota kasher asit, I will do to you like you have done. Asher bazit Allah la ferberit. You have despised your promise to nullify a covenant. There was a covenant between us. There was a relationship that supposed was forged, and you forsook that relationship. And yet, I will remember the covenant I made with you the days of your youth. Right? And there's a certain beautiful image of God looking back you know, the Zachar Tilach, Chesed Ni'urayich that we often sing about, we read about the Haftorah and uh, on Yom Kippur. I remember the days of your youth. God still looks back at that and that covenant, that relationship at the very beginning. I will again uphold for you the eternal covenant. You will remember your ways and be humiliated. When you take your older sisters to your younger sisters, meaning all those, uh, all, 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 I believe it refers to, um, oh no, now Rashi says this refers to when you re re recover all these properties, all these, all these cities that are going to be taken from you. Um, and it likely refers to the 10 tribes. They will be your daughters, or in this case, it means your uh, towns. Below me, Brite, but not because you, you kept the covenant, but rather because of my kindness, Rashi says, because I'm going to be kind to you. I'm going to bestow kindness upon you. I will uphold my covenant with you. You will know that I am God. So that you will remember and be embarrassed. You will no longer have any sort of ability to utter a defense due to your shame. And I atone for everything you have done. So the ending of the parak, which is often the way Yechaskel ends these different nivuot, it's with a promise of salvation, but it's not just salvation. And it's also sort of a, a context to all the horrible things the chapter talks about. Hashem says, the Navi says, the purpose of this is for you to be humiliated. Because Hashem is saying, I need you to be not just sad about what you have done, but humiliated. I need you to be embarrassed. I need you to feel that shame of all your behavior. And when you do that, that will lead me for the, that will give me the opportunity to uphold the covenant, the covenant of your youth that is eternal, for you to return to Yerushalayim and to regain everything that you have lost. And that's the hopeful note that the <laughs> chapter ends with. So a very, very graphic <laughs> chapter. There's a lot there. And I um, you could dig into a lot of those specific formulations we sort of glossed over. Um, but I do think one takeaway that I take is just the way, the very passionate way Hashem looks at his relationship with Kal Yisrael, as we see so often, it's both compared to the relationship of parent to child and husband to wife among spouses. It's a passionate, real, almost physical blood relationship. And Hashem is so, so... Um, betrayed, betrayed. When the Jewish people forsake that relationship, it's a feeling of betrayal, of 
my 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 wife was disloyal to me. She forsook me for others, and it, it hurts and it's painful, and the retribution is painful. But Hashem still, even in this very dark time, and even as He portrays that awful punishment, He ends with the idea of the Brit Olam, the Brit's new Raya, the covenant of the youth, the eternal covenant. So may he bring it very soon. Thank you all for learning with me. I start with you again. I'm happy to stay for a few minutes for questions and observations. Have a wonderful week.